Hello, welcome to News Center. I'm Parikshit Lutra. Let's start with the top corporate story of the day, and that continues to be the Adani Group. All 10 group companies, including NDTV, ended in the red today as the route continues. Group stocks lost over 51,000 crore rupees in market capitalization just today, taking the total loss since the Hindenburg report to more than 10 lakh crore rupees. The group has pledged additional shares worth more than 1,000 crore rupees to SBI for the Carmichael project in Australia. Shares uh, that amount to 1% stake in Adani Ports, 0.55% stake in Adani Transmissions and 1% stake in Adani Green have been pledged additionally. SBI said Adani Group's pledge was used to only top up the collateral and no new loans will be sanctioned. Meanwhile, the Finance Ministry, in a response to a question in Parliament, revealed the exposure of public sector general insurance companies to the Adani Group. New India Assurance, United Insurance, National Insurance, Oriental Insurance and General Insurance have exposure to the Adani Group, which amounts to 0.14% of total assets under management. However, the government statement added that financial institutions like Exim Bank, SIDB, NHB and Nabad could not divulge information under their act. Separately, the Supreme Court heard the Adani matter today. Here's Ashmit Kumar uh, with more on that. Ashmit, what uh, kind of directions or observations has the Supreme Court made? Well, just for the context to begin with, it's on Friday that there was the first hearing in this case and that's when uh, the Supreme Court had served up three issues before the Solicitor General. The first was about the sufficiency and the competency of the current framework for investor protection. The Supreme Court had said that uh, middle class has massive exposure uh, to the stock markets, that uh, lacks of wealth has been eroded and therefore had sought questions from uh, the Solicitor General on sufficiency of the current framework uh, for investor protection. The second was on whether or not additional legislative or regulatory tools can be used for strengthening this framework. That was the second issue. The third was uh, what about an expert panel? This was a suggestion that fell from the Apex Court that perhaps an expert panel may be needed uh, to advise, to recommend uh, any additions or changes uh, to the framework in place. Now, these questions were answered in brief by the Solicitor General today before the Apex Court. First up, uh, the Solicitor General appearing on behalf of the government, he said that the current framework is in fact competent to deal with such scenarios, such shocks, uh, that there are enough secure safeguards in place. That was first. Uh, the second, Solicitor General said that uh, at this point, while this current system was sufficient, it was uh, open to the idea that was suggested by the Apex, Apex Court for suggesting for having an expert panel. That was the second key takeaway. The third is that, importantly, Solicitor General warned and perhaps expressed concern on behalf of the government that, look, uh, if an expert panel is deliberating on the issue, it could send potentially adverse uh, situations signals to global investors and that may be a cause of concern and towards that end uh, what has fallen from the solicitor general is that the scope and the remit of this expert committee should be limited and that the government should be the one suggesting names of experts to this panel and towards that end has said that it will submit both of them in a sealed envelope only for the eyes of the judges so no call has been taken on that yet the matter will be taken up for further hearing on friday that's when uh, the supreme court will resume hearing Right, uh, important legal uh, steps there in the Supreme Court as far as the Adani group uh, goes. Let's see what happens in the days to come. Thanks, Ashmit, for joining us. Uh, moving on to the Aero India, which is uh, taking place in Bengaluru. India's defence might was in full display on day one of the Aero India show, touted to be Asia's biggest aviation programme. Prime Minister Narendra Modi inaugurated the five-day event in Bengaluru. He said that the event reflects India's new strength and aspirations. More than 800 companies from 98 countries would be participating. MOUs worth 75,000 crore rupees are expected to be inked. Ritu Singh gets us all the action from Aero India. Ladies and gentlemen, stages rolling. हमारा लक्ष्य है कि 2024-25 तक हम एक्सपोर्ट के इस आंकड़े को डेढ़ बिलियन से बढ़ाकर पांच बिलियन डॉलर तक ले जाएंगे। Well, Prime Minister Modi today inaugurated the 14th edition of the Aero India here in Bengaluru, 
hoping to garner investments of more than 75,000 crores. Several global players present here at the exhibition. We spoke to many of them. Boeing, for instance, said it will look to expand its presence in India and set up a logistics warehouse. Uh, it expects significant demand to come from in, in India and wants to garner a large chunk of that. Uh, Swedish major Saab also said uh, it is bullish on India's defense market and said while it had mutually called off the MOU with Adani Group, uh, it would not say no to a potential future partnership, although it did not comment further uh, on this matter. Uh, France based Thales also said it will expand its footprint here and double down on hiring as it completes 70 years in India. A billion dollars or 8,000 crores every year, that is the exports or the sourcing we do from India each year, yes. right? Yes. Of which two thirds is manufacturing. Yes. Um, in terms of investments, there's an additional $200 million campus that we're doing right here in Bengaluru. Okay. And then um, this logistics center, you know, we don't have an exact number, but it'll be in the in the 200 crore realm uh, of investment. Well, you've said that you decided to part ways with the Adani group mutually. Uh, but in future, if an opportunity does arise, would you look at partnering with them again, or have you severed ties for good? I, we, we, I don't say no to anyone when it comes to that. It's depending on the situation. In certain cases, company A is better than company B, and company C could be better than company D, and so forth. So at this door, we are not closing any doors for future partnerships. We see a great potential uh, to develop a presence in India and to uh, not only address the Indian market, which is obviously very attractive, yeah. but also address the global market from India. Mm -hmm. So our engineering centers uh, in Noida and Bangalore currently represent uh, 1,400 uh, engineers, uh, okay. uh, and we plan to double this number by 2026. More than 800 companies are going to be participating in this five-day-long exhibition. About 100 of them are foreign companies and more than 700 are actually Indian companies, which includes some of the MSMEs and startups that will be showcasing their niche technology, the growth uh, in the aerospace and defense capability that they've achieved in the last few years. The theme this time around for the event is runway to a billion opportunities. And with the government's Make in India push, Indian companies also see huge potential for growth. Uh, we already have uh, uh, surprisingly very large export orders mm. uh, for our artillery guns. Mm. And five years ago, if anybody asked me would I ever be exporting artillery guns to mm. Europe, yeah. I, would, I would have said no. Okay, because I, I, I never thought that this could be possible. All right, on that note, we take a short break, but uh, when we return, we get you a special interaction with Nissan's global CEO, Ashwini Gupta, on the India investment announcement and their renewed commitment to the India market. Hey, we are writing the next chapter in Alliance in India uh, as a global alliance strategy we announced in London uh, last week. Uh, this new chapter in India um, will be based on our last 15 years uh, of experience, but also the growth potential of India becoming the third largest market. Hence, uh, we decided to invest $600 million or 5,300 crores of rupees in six brand new products, out of which four uh, brand new products will be C-segment SUVs for Renault and Nissan and two A-segment uh, battery, uh, battery electric. In addition to that, we will create additional 2,000 employment, not only to do uh, the development in India for India, but also doing the software development and the digital uh, development out of India for our whole uh, worldwide operations. Right. Uh, so that is an important commitment. Give us a sense of when do these vehicles start getting rolled out from the factory. What is uh, the launch plan for these six vehicles, including the two A-segment EVs you're speaking about? Yeah, we will start from 2025. Uh, and then, of course, we will share with you uh, uh, the, the full uh, schedule of the launch plan of the six. Uh, out of these six, uh, the most important for us is the A-segment uh, battery EV, uh, where uh, we are working on the full competitive supply chain. And these A-segment battery EV cars uh, will, of course, uh, will be for India, but also uh, for the for the export uh, for the export purposes. 
Right. So uh, that is an important point that you're looking to export them as well. Now, if we look at all these six vehicles, including the four C-segment SUVs, the two A-segment uh, electric vehicles, what will be the extent of localization, uh, the extent of import in these vehicles, Mr. Gupta? Yeah, I think um, uh, for the Magnite, which we have done here, we are very close to 98% localization. Um, you know, 15 years before, when we started our operations in India, we started with doing the localization of the global models, and now we are completely transforming the way we do business in India to do um, globalization of local models. This is how we have changed, and this is how we are going to move forward. For the battery electric cars, uh, we are working on it, especially on the full supply chain driven by the vertical integration as we do in Europe, US, China, and Japan. And we'll come back what would be, but our um, objective is to maximize the competitive localization mm. so that uh, it is affordable in India, but also uh, outside the India. Right. Uh, Mr. Gupta, when you speak about a full supply chain and vertical integration on uh, EVs here in India, would you be also sourcing uh, battery cells, battery packs locally in India in order to keep the cost lower? Uh, are you looking out for sourcing partners? Yeah, I, I mean, this is, the, this is the job which I think teams have to do from now. Mm. Having said that, what should be our ultimate goal? Our ultimate goal should be, uh, you know, that customers should naturally decide that they want battery electric cars. You know, we are not the one who should make customers' decision on, on their behalf. Mm. Our job is to be enabler for a natural decision of customer. How we do that? Three mm. things. Driving uh, performance, total cost of ownership, mm -hmm. and environment friendly. I think the first and the third box we can take with battery electric car. The second one, which is total cost of ownership, is purely driven by the competitive localization. Mm -hmm. It's always a question of economy of scale. Mm -hmm. For example, in Europe, if we decide to invest in battery electric, 19% of the market, uh, so which means we have economy of scale. In India, it's 0.5%. Mm -hmm. On the other side, the, the experts are saying that by 2030, 13% of the Indian automotive market will be battery electric, which gives uh, enough confidence for us to invest in mid to long term. Mm -hmm. That's why today, as we uh, collaborated with the uh, government of Tamil Nadu, and we would like to collaborate with central government also, that how we join hands with only one objective is how to make the battery electric car so much competitive that the customers by themselves naturally uh, ask for it. Mr. Gupta, uh, when you speak about uh, making electric vehicles competitive, uh, several CEOs have said that possibly the best price point to roll out an electric vehicle would be 8 lakh rupees on road, not ex showroom, but 8 lakhs as an on road price. Uh, is that something that you would be targeting? I mean, we as Nissan, we are more driven by the total cost of ownership, to be honest with you. I mean, and total cost of ownership is driven by how much uh, charging facility we are giving at home. Of course, public infrastructure should support, but we, as Nissan, we believe in home charging, uh, which is more convenient uh, for the for the for the customer. Of course, in addition to the in addition to the public infrastructure. So, what is the total cost of ownership? Is driven by charging uh, excess, but also is driven by the quality and the durability of battery, mm. uh, which means the quality and the durability of battery should be competitive enough to move that. So, for us, mm. when it comes to the cost of localization, I think the battery cost anywhere between $80 to a kilowatt hour to $90 to a kilowatt hour makes a, a very competitive uh, total cost of ownership. Second, the durability of the battery somewhere between 8 to 12 years, depending on the driving experience, driving behavior of the customer, makes the total cost of ownership much better. So we are not going for the entry price. What we are going for is the total cost of ownership as competitive uh, throughout the life cycle. All right. And what about plans to make uh, electric vehicle batteries in India? Is that some sort of a plan that uh, uh, that Renault and Nissan are considering in the long term? We are studying now, and uh, I think we will come back to you. But as I said before, the final goal for us should be to manage India uh, electrification in the same way we are managing in other markets. Uh, Nissan, by 2030, will have 44% of its products uh, with the electrified vehicle mix, uh, you know. And, and, and India, if by 2030, uh, uh, the market is expected to be 13% mix, which means 
Nissan will have a great opportunity to utilize its strength of 44% electrified product mix into a market which will be roughly 13%. But again, these are the statistics which everybody's forecasting, but we will never know. The, the markets can change uh, very rapidly depending on number one, what is the magnitude of the government support? Number two, how many competitors are coming up with different options? And number three, how customer behavior is evolving? I think the combination of these three can rapidly change the market mix. This is what we have seen in Japan. This is what we are seeing now in the United States. Right. Uh, I'd like to ask you about these uh, six new vehicles which you're going to be launching starting 2025. Uh, the press release says that you will be developing these vehicles for the India market, three for each company under the alliance. Uh, so the SUV and the EV mix will be divided between Renault and Nissan. Will these be absolutely new vehicles ground up or are these vehicles and platforms available in the rest of the world and you will now be bringing them to India? I mean, there are, there are two ways of doing uh, thinking over it. One is... Um, we are alliance when it comes to maximizing each other's asset localize, uh, utilization, but we are brand distinctive. We are totally two different PNL companies. We are two different brands. So all the six cars will be brand new cars, brand new products uh, with a distinctive uh, brand identity, three for Renault and three for Nissan. However, when it comes to execution, uh, we will be using the common platforms and the common sourcings and the common engineering and the manufacturing teams to make it more competitive because we will have access to the economy of scale. This is how we are we are we are moving forward. Very soon, I think in few weeks and few months from now, we will be sharing with you uh, the product sketches uh, representing the brand distinctiveness uh, in um, uh, to you. All right, so Nissan and Renault still betting big on India. They're likely to roll out six cars, four SUVs, two electric cars starting 2025 onwards, and all of it with an investment of 5,300 crores. We're going to take a short break. On the other side, a special conversation with Hitachi Energy's Claudio Facin and uh, Venu Nuguri on their fourth India plant in Chennai. Don't go anywhere. My colleague Jude Sanit caught up with the Hitachi management. Welcome back. You're watching News Center. Sustainable energy player Hitachi Energy has launched its fourth India plant in the last year. The company's Chennai facility will manufacture advanced power electronics with 80% sourcing from India. In a CNBC TV 18 exclusive, the company's CEO Claudio Fachin told Jude Sanit that the company is looking to strengthen localization in India. Take a look. I believe it's your fourth in the last year or so. That's an approximate one plant per quarter. So at the outset, what does this do to your capacity here in India? And what's the investment like in all these plants that you've been launching over the year, Claudio? Yeah, sure. Uh, first of all, it's a pleasure to be to be back. And, and as you said, it's it's been a quite consistent, uh, maybe even some kind of small steps, uh, uh, but uh, all uh, really well planned and, and uh, actually really well aligned with what we see is the need not only for uh, the Indian demand and not only to help uh, accelerating the energy transition, the clean energy transition for India, but also globally. And, and this one here, it's right at the center of that. We're talking about HVDC technology. We're yes. talking about also uh, power quality with Stackcom uh, technology that will help uh, adding the much needed flexibility mm -hmm. to that future energy system. And, and what we're having here is actually taking the next step, uh, which we were missing, uh, of localizing uh, the manufacturing of the converter valve, which is the key part of the technology. We already have the converter transformer technology localized uh, in, in India. We already have the control system. So now we're completing the whole uh, portfolio of what is uh, basically the HVDC technology that comes uh, on top of the AC grid uh, to deliver this uh, decarbonized energy system. Right. And I'm told HVDC is a very critical component, you know, especially here in India, given the renewable energy targets we have by 2030 and transmitting that power becomes all the more crucial. But, you know, given the pace of plant launches you've had, uh, how much ability do you have right now in this market insofar as transmission is concerned? Is there a capacity that you know you can achieve here in India after these launches? So, uh, first of all, it's, it's um, what we have in India is 80, 85% of what we do globally. 
is now localized. And, and that's a very important part because India represents also a very important market across the entire portfolio of technologies, across the entire portfolio of applications that are needed to strengthen, enhance uh, the grid piece which is basically connecting from generation to consumption uh, the future electrical system. And, and from that perspective, we're, we're, we're looking at, once again, uh, uh, learning, creating our footprint, strengthening our footprint and learning from India, and then taking also some of those learnings uh, outside India. The, the differentiator part here is, of course, India is a very competitive market. Uh, you heard me say this uh, many times, and it's good for us to be here right. precisely to make sure that we have that uh, competitiveness uh, uh, edge, but at the same time is, is a market that is creating an opportunity to scale mm -hmm. a lot of these technologies, and, and not many markets can give you that extra uh, advantage. Absolutely. And Vinu, let's talk. And with that, it's a wrap on this edition of News Center. Thank you for watching. Stay tuned to CNBC TV 18. News continues on the other side.